Epistaxis, uh, nosebleeds. Nosebleeds are quite common, and when they bleed, they bleed really nicely. Why? Why are they so common? Why do they bleed really nicely? Let's have a look at uh, Little's area, or Kieselbach's plexus, and better understand where that blood's coming from, what you might compress to stop it bleeding, all that sort of stuff. The anatomy of, the anatomy of nosebleeds, I guess. <laughs> The nose, um, so the nose is, it, it's the first part of the airway. The deeper you get into the body, the, the airway becomes very, very delicate. So um, the nasal cavity, the nose has a number of jobs. One of those jobs, one of its big jobs is to humidify and warm the air as we're breathing it in before it gets down to those more delicate tissues and cells. Um, of course, it's also got roles in trapping particulates and pathogens and presenting them to the immune system. Um, smell, oh yeah, the nose does smell. Uh, the paranasal sinuses drain in here, that sort of thing. So, um, what we would need to do um, if we wanted to rapidly humidify and warm air as it enters the airway here, well, we want lots of surface area, and that's what we see with the the bones here, the conchi and the, the turbinate bones. Um, and we see a mucosa, a lovely, in life we'd see a lovely pink mucosa, quite a thin mucosa. And we see a rich arterial supply. So um, lots of arterial blood passing into this region and then leaving through capillaries, but a high throughput of blood. So you've got the things you need to humidify and warm the air as it goes through. The thing we can't see here is there is a nasal septum, a midline nasal septum that separates that nasal cavity into right sides and left sides. And we, we know, sorry, <laughs> we know we've got one of these because we know that um, we breathe through each individual nostril and one nostril tends to be clearer than the other at any one time. Anyway, so the septum is adding more surface area. It's also driving the flow of air through particular routes here and that's the mechanism. So nosebleeds, rich blood supply, thin mucosa, aha. Right, I've got a septum. <coughs> so we're inside the nasal cavity now. Uh, that's the septum in the midline. Uh, you can see the cavity and the turbinate bones over there, the conchi. Um, if that's anterior and posterior, the bones we can see here, here's the frontal bone, um, here's the hard palate of the maxilla, there's the lip, that's a palatine bone, there's a sphenoid bone, there's the ethmoid bone. Names of the bones and bits are going to be useful to name the arteries that come through here. And here, this is our nasal septum. Look, it's got three parts. Um, so this bit here is actually part of the ethmoid bone. This is running in the midline. This is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. This here is its own bone with one of my favorite names, this is Voma. And here is um, the cartilage part, the cartilaginous nasal septum. And these three parts form to come together to form a septum that separates the left and right nasal cavities. Um, and this is also covered in mucosa. This also has a very rich blood supply because of course it would because of those functions that we just described, right? So Little's area, also named Kieselbach's plexus, named after the two, they, they both found it, described it independently. Anyway, Little's area or Kieselbach's plexus is here. It's anteriorly and inferiorly on the nasal septum and on both sides of the nasal septum. So it's that, that's where it is. There are five arteries, or you may read four arteries supplying blood there. We'll have a look at those in a moment. Um, but it's, it's, it's here that if the mucosa is damaged, then blood, oh look, we're, you can see how close we are anteriorly to the nasal aperture. This is where the blood is gonna come from. But that does mean that because this, well, means a couple of things, doesn't it? If this um, plexus of arteries 
is very anterior and inferior on the nasal septum. It means it is prone to injury from picking your nose, um, you know, from, from trauma like that, um, if the mucosa gets injured. But it also means that if there is bleeding, you can put pressure on that part of the nasal septum fairly easily. Maybe the bleeding isn't, isn't as far back as you think it is. That's if the bleeding is coming from Little's area. In 90% of if nosebleeds, 90% of epistaxis cases, the blood is coming from Little's area. If I take this off again carefully this time, you can see just about, this is the mucosa, we've got lots of arteries and lots of branches in here. And if we look at that side, we can see some of those branches running to the nasal septum itself. Um, so let's, let's name them. So um, the maxillary artery of the deep face is essentially coming from the other side. That'll pop through here. One of its terminal branches is the sphenopalatine artery. That's going to come through there and get into this region. There are two ethmoidal arteries um, coming from the orbit, actually, which is just lateral to this. You have anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries. The palate is down here. There's a greater palatine artery that punches through here. And then there's a superior labial artery that also comes up and this way. Look, there we are. It finds its way up and around here. So um, sphenopalatine, anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries, greater palatine arteries and superior labial arteries. And they'll actually send branches into that septum that I've taken off now. Um, I mean, this, this is, um, I don't know if you can imagine the three-dimensionalness of all of this, but this is a, um, you know, it's a pretty narrow space. So those arteries that are coming through here quite easily send branches to that nasal septum to vascularize it. Um, fun bit of anatomy here. If the sphenopalatine artery is coming from the maxillary artery, that makes it a branch ultimately from the external carotid artery. Likewise, the greater palatine artery is also from the external carotid artery. The superior labial artery is a branch of the facial artery. So that's also a branch from the external carotid artery. But these two anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries, if they're coming from the orbit, they are branches of the ophthalmic artery, which is itself a branch of the internal carotid artery. So we have branches of internal and external carotid arteries coming together here in the nasal cavity. That's, that's how well vascularized it is. Um, yeah, which is why you don't dry out your lungs. Okay. Uh, my ENT colleagues tell me the mnemonic for this, for remembering the arteries of Little's area is legs. I'm not very good with the mnemonics. Legs, okay, labial, ethmoidal, greater palatine, sphenopalatine. Um, that's how they remember them. Um, the other thing here, so 90% of nosebleeds come from Little's area, or Kieselbach, Kieselbach's plexus on the septum. Um, Woodruff's plexus, um, if you read about that, that's actually in the lateral wall way back here. And um, Woodruff's plexus, I think the bleeding from here is more likely in old people uh, with hypertension and that sort of thing. And that's uh, much harder to get to, of course. So um, nosebleeds tend to be caused by, like we say, you know, picking your nose, direct trauma. A trauma to the nose, you know, um, a blow to the nose uh, can damage that same area. Um, drying out the mucosa itself will make it more susceptible to um, break and cause nosebleeds and that might be caused by you know dry air, dry warm air such as central heating systems uh, in the winter, changes in air temperatures that sort of thing. It can be caused if you're on uh, anticoagulant make medication you know anti, uh, anti clotting drugs. Um, or it can be caused, you know, if you've got a cold and you're just blowing your nose a lot, you blow your nose too hard, again, that can damage the mucosa. But Little's area is responsible for most nosebleeds and it's on the, the nasal septum there. All right, that's it. Um, hope that was useful. See you next week.